Have you heard about DHA Properties, Defence Housing Australia? It's where you can buy a property and rent it out to the military. A lot of people come across this and they ask me, PK, does this make sense? It seems really good. It seems like a really terrific investment. Do they make for good investments or is it too good to be true? The glossy brochure, the fancy Facebook ad with all the perks. Does that make sense to buy or not? In this video or this episode, I'll be going through the pros and the cons so you can make up your own mind. Okay, I don't have any affiliation with DHA. This is just impartial, objective statistics and objective facts as I see them. If you're interested, carry on watching. My name is PK and I help people build passive income through property investment using data without needing, you know, a 15K buyer's agent every single time. And if you're interested in the economy, property investing and financial happiness, that's what we talk about in this channel. Smash the subscribe button, give it a like, let's go. So what are the pros about of DHA properties? DHA properties, you know, they're like in, in areas across Australia. A lot of them are actually in Queensland, New South Wales, Northern Territory, where you can, you know, buy this property and, you know, there is a lease on it to the military or to the defence ministry you could say and you know oftentimes those leases are five years ten year leases with you know good rents you know they they make on the surface to have to be really good properties right like, like what could go wrong you're getting a good return you know it's being managed for you by someone else what could go wrong the two pros that i want to mention number one you get a higher rent than you would get for non-dha property so let's say you bought in i'm just making this up townsville and, you know, your property would be probably the market rate would be maybe $500 a week for your rental. If it's a DHA property, you can get much, much higher rent. In fact, that 5%, 6% yield can go all the way up to 8%, 9%, sometimes even 10% yield. Some, you're doubling your yield, right? And so on the face of it, it seems like, well, this is like a no-brainer. Like, why wouldn't I buy this property where I'm spending the same amount of money, but I'm getting double the cash flow, double the passive income? So that's obviously one of the positives, but, you know, <laughs> to stick to the end, we'll, we'll go through all the warts and all. The second positive is that, they, in, in other words, defense housing, they provide the maintenance for you, right? So let's say an air conditioning goes bust or there's some sort of plumbing issue or an electrical issue. You know, as property investors, we often have, you know, $1,000, $2,000 on average per year over the course of 10, 20 years of maintenance bill to upkeep our properties. Defense housing does all that for you. So it's like less headache, less maintenance. I mean, it's not really a headache anyway because your property manager does it, but they pay for it. So you're reducing your annual outgoing. So not only is rent higher, your cost of holding from a maintenance perspective is lower. So, so far it's like, you know, this seems like to be a unicorn property investing strategy. Let me go for this. All right. So hang on. Let's go through the cons one by one. I think there's like eight of them. Number one con is the management fee of defense or DHA properties is much higher. So like in an ordinary sense, the uh, management fees, the property management fees, you know, for a normal privately owned held property could be somewhere between six to nine percent. You know, I'm just generalizing here. And this whole video is generalization because there's always exceptions to the rule. Any rule is there to be broken. But, you know, let's say six to nine percent. For DHA properties, the property management fee can be up to 16 and a half, sometimes 17 percent. All right. So why is that a why is that a con? Well, obviously, it costs more to pay or to have that property managed. You can't manage it yourself. You can't get a private manager. It has to be managed by defense housing. But that additional property management fee eats into that additional rent that you're getting. So that's that's a really significant downside. The second downside is that actually, if you look at the lease terms between you and defense housing, they have stipulated in clauses that they can cancel the lease at any point in time, but you can't. All right, so let's say you've been baited by a three-year lease, a five-year lease, a 10-year lease, which, you know, not uncommon for these types of properties. That's why a lot of, you know, new novice property investors, newbie investors get kind of drawn towards these types of investment strategies like fireflies to the flame, you know, because they seem really good on the face of it. Long lease, what could go wrong? 
but actually they can terminate that lease at any point, whereas you can't. So all the risk is held by you. They could come back in a year and say, look, much like a bit what they're doing in Townsville at the moment, they're like, mm, we're, we're kind of exiting this area. You know, here's your property back. Good luck. You know, you, you don't want that to happen. So that's the second con. The third con is that Defense Housing, they do their own rent reviews and the rent can go down at any point in time. All right. So it's like, okay, I've got a five year lease, I've got a three year lease, I've got a 10 year lease, you know, that gives me some stability. But the rent's not flat. In fact, it's not even going up like a commercial property, 3%, 4% every year. They can go up and down at their whim. You can't really challenge that. That's kind of baked into the lease agreement, the clauses, the stipulations where they can kind of decide based on what year they're seeing in the market, whether the rent goes up and down. And generally speaking, if you're buying in a good area, privately owned properties, you know, rented out to, you know, non-DHA renters, you know, rents don't really go down that much so that's a that's a big risk with dha the fourth con or downside is that these are generally generally only available in areas where they need to house obviously defense personnel it's it's not just they love giving property investors money they're looking for accommodation they want accommodation for you know military bases for the defense personnel who you know presumably doing a really good job However, most times, and this is a generalization, most times they're located in sparsely populated areas where their drivers for capital growth, for ongoing rent increases, for, you know, building wealth really aren't there. So like right now we're going through a national property boom, you know, by and large, we've just gone through one. So even these properties have done well. But in normal times, like in normal times when there's no like crazy property boom going on, these areas where these DHA properties are located, they don't tend to perform as well because they're in, you know, and look, there's exceptions like in Brisbane, there's Inogra, which they have a military base there. And that's actually a really premium suburb. But generally speaking, they're kind of in whoop whoop with basically not much growth over the long term. All right. The fifth downside is that it's an illiquid asset illiquid asset. And you know how I said before how the leases go for three years, five years, 10 years, something like that. And that the DHA, they can break the lease at any time, but you can't. So let's say they don't break the lease, but your financial circumstances change. Let's say for whatever reason, let's go extreme case, you know, you lose your job, your wife, husband, partner, they lose their job as well. And you need to sell, you know, they need to sell this property to get some of your funds back. You can't really do that very easily because no one wants to buy these, right? Only investors will buy DHA properties with an existing lease because an owner occupier will want to move to live there, right? But you can't because there's already tenants in there for the next five, 10 years. So that means that the opportunity to sell that property goes from like 100% of the population down to about, you know, let's say 30, 10 to 30% of the population, about 30% of home buyers are investors. But those who are interested in DHA are like even a small subset of that. So it's really hard to sell this kind of asset once you're trapped into a lease and that makes it illiquid and adds an additional layer of risk onto this property investing strategy. All right, I think that was number five. Number six is that normally these types of properties are overpriced, okay? They're overcapitalized. And I mean, there's different reasons for that. You know, some that come to my mind is, you know, because there's a long lease involved with that, you know, oftentimes uh, um, investors can get carried away and overpay for them or the stipulated, you know, value that the seller wants that can be over exaggerated as well because they're like oh you're getting this 10 year lease whereas the location the the land size the the property doesn't really value it so they're obviously they're oftentimes overvalued for for what you get um, and and that's really not a good thing you in an area you want to buy the typical type of property. You don't want to buy a hero property, right? You don't want to buy the best property on the worst street or something like that. You know what I mean? So yeah, that's another con to it. And I think we're up to, what is it, number seven or eight? Um, the last one that I'll go through is that it's 
these DHA properties are normally newer type of properties with lower land to asset ratio. So if you haven't watched my video on whether you should buy new or old properties, I, I won't spoil it for you. I'll link it right here. It's a very popular video. But basically what this means is that if you have a newer type of property, you know, normally when councils release or rezone land, they go from block size of 1,000 down to 800 or 800 square meters down to 607 or 607 down to 400 or 400 down to 300. You know, new rezonings, new subdivisions, the land sizes or the allotments are normally smaller and smaller and smaller. And so therefore, when you buy a newer property, you're getting less and less of land. And it's the land that appreciates, not the building. So with this DHA type of properties, normally, I mean, just generalization, they normally have, you know, a four bedroom house or, you know, something like that, fully built out, but the land component is not very large. And so they don't appreciate and as much as an established existing property with a larger land allotment. You know, that's just property economics 101. I know a lot of people get sort of trapped with this whole concept of I should buy new because of easier to get a tenant, lower maintenance costs. I mean, those things are immaterial when you actually understand property economics more holistically. So those, those are eight downsides. And I think to summarize, um, you know, for me, and I think almost everyone that I talk to who is a seasoned property investor, they term DHA properties as lazy investments. Are they bad? No, no, I'm not here to say that they're bad investments. You can still make money off, off anything, really. Every strategy has its niche. You know, every strategy, you know, suits different people, different strokes for different folks. But normally people who are looking to build a passive income long term and want capital growth and positive cash flow, right, they want that combination and the ability to add value. If it's not now, maybe in the future. And they just want that predictability right? That's not really the strategy for them. DHA is like a lazy investment. If you're really serious about property investment, you can do much better, a higher rate of return or cash on cash return, return on investment than DHA. If you're not really serious about property investing and you just want something that's super low risk, uh, super low maintenance, I should say, not super low risk, super low maintenance, and you're like, oh, I just need to park my money somewhere, then yeah, you might consider it. But I would also deeply get you to contemplate and implore you, don't forget the opportunity cost. And that's true for other things like NDIS, NRAS, all this stuff. I'll, li I'll link right here to a video I've done similar vein to NDIS properties. A lot of people, you know, get enamored by the ads and what the companies say you know it's the sales pitches are pretty alluring I should say but you know you scratch underneath the surface and it's not quite all that so hopefully this kind of just truth um, helps you if, if I've generalized too much and you think that I've missed a positive or a pro put that in the comments. If you think I've missed other negatives, put that in the comments. You know, for those of you who've been through this route, you know, maybe had good experiences or bad experiences with um, DHA properties, Defence Housing Australia, put them in the comments below so everyone can get benefit. And if you want to level up your knowledge about property investing in Australia, I'll leave links below to my Facebook group with more than 20,000 investors and also leave a link below to my podcast on Google, Apple Podcasts and Spotify where you can really, really, really improve your knowledge in a targeted, you know, scientific way based on data. Okay, if this was valuable to you, smash the subscribe button, give that thumbs up, a big, big tick, you know, press that on YouTube, that helps me a lot. And as always, I'll see you next time. My name's PK, thank you for being with me. Catch you later.